Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Greifinger, Deputy Commissioner and Chief Medical Officer for the New York State Department of Correctional Services. Since you already know how to protect yourself from getting HIV infection, we've designed this program to help you understand the importance of getting tested for HIV. Treatment is available, which is life-sustaining. It's available to you. Help save a life, yours or someone you love. Hi guys, my name is Tony, I'm a recovering addict. <coughs> yeah. right. I let you know that word addict tells you where I've been and the word recovering tells you where I'm at, at least just for today. They gave me one of these shirts because the other one caused too much trouble with the cameras. If the warden's in the room, remember I borrowed this shirt. I don't really belong here. Just want to kick that out there now. Uh, <coughs> up till a couple of weeks ago, my job involved standing outside of shooting galleries and crack dens in East Harlem and the South Bronx. My job involved carrying a message to the people who don't know how to reach out. My message involved educating them about the virus, that if they can't stop shooting dope, there is another way. Trying to get them into detox. And if you've ever seen someone who just got off the crack stem, they're not always receptive to your message. I mean, I got caught with my back up against the wall, had to take off my jewelry, you know, and just make sure there were no holes in the wall behind me where they can reach out of. Of course, the first thing they want to see is if I got gold around my neck, if I got a ring they can get something for, or if my bag is made out of leather and how many vials can they get for it. But uh, the people out there are part of the problem, and those are the people who need the message. Sometimes if you want to carry a message, you've got to get the right messenger. Because for 25 years I was in hell. My way of dealing with life was with the spike in one arm and with the vodka in the other. And by the time I woke up, I had a whole set of other problems. Because in 1985, I came in contact with a 12-step program that some of you know about called NA, and it didn't quite take. See, I didn't want to put down the methadone and the coke long enough to hear the message. I went into the room and says, listen, you prove to me it works, and I'll put this stuff down. And they told me, you put the stuff down, and we'll prove to you it works. <laughs> well, I was at a standstill. <laughs> so for two years, I hung out down the village outside the 12-step meetings down in St. Mark's. And after two years of hanging out in the village down at St. Mark's, I was sick enough for quite a few other 12-step programs. After two years of messing with 12 steps, it screwed up my high. And I realized that 12 steps by itself weren't going to do it. I needed something else. So I went into a detox. See, I had a two-year heroin problem, and I got on methadone. The methadone detox took the next 15 years of my life. It took me 15 years of meth to get off that two years of heroin. In 1987, I went into that detox, and this is pretty much where my story starts. Because two weeks into the detox, I winded up on life support machines. Doctors advised me to take an HIV test. No one ever educated me about HIV. No one told me what the letters meant. No one says if you're going to stick a needle in your arm and you use bleach, the bleach will kill the virus. They didn't take the time out to do this. So the last day I was in the hospital, I took the test and went back to the rehab. I sat in the detox, 10 o'clock at night, two weeks later, and I called them up. The doctor got on the phone and he says, we got good news and we got bad news. He says, the good news is it wasn't PCP, the age-related pneumonia. The bad news is you got the virus anyway, and if you've got any questions, call up the gay men's health crisis. And he hung up on me. Now you know what it is after 25 years of sticking a spike in your arm and finally trying to get back into life and then having a doctor drop a bomb like this on you and then abandoning you? Needless to say, the detox didn't quite mean as much as it used to because I didn't think I was going to live long enough to make it out of there. A month later, I was still underway from the life support machines. I came down with an eye infection. A month after that, they declared me legally blind. My doctor and a professor from NYU got me in a room and they showed me what they wanted to do to me, this little experiment. They got a model of an eyeball, about like your big, and they showed me exactly where they were going to stick the needles in. I said, you got to be kidding. You want to stick needles in my eye? <laughs> my eye. That's about the only place I never stuck a needle. <laughs> I couldn't believe this. They put me on the operating table and got this nurse to hold my hand so I wouldn't belt one of them. 
And they came at me and they had these needles with the little brown collars, the same ones I used when I was out there. Payback's a bitch. <laughs> but I went through this. And when they drew that serum out, they sent it to a lab and they actually grew the HIV virus multiplying in my eye. It hit the headlines so much that it even came out in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. They had this story about a 37-year-old IV drug user who lost his sight from HIV. Well, I started medication uh, a month after that. Antiviral therapy, some of you have probably heard about it. While I was on the antiviral therapy, I came down with a skin problem. It looked like they put a blowtorch to me. While I was battling the skin problem, I came down with another virus attacking my nervous system. I sat in the detox for Thanksgiving dinner. 20 pounds underweight, I couldn't see the food I was eating. I had a long sleeve shirt on in 90 degree weather to hide my skin. And the other virus was hitting my nervous system so bad that I couldn't sit still long enough to finish the meal while it was hot. My counselors didn't bother talking to me because they didn't know what to say. The other people in the rehab sat at other tables because they didn't know what they were going to catch. I actually had one guy get out of a shower stall because he found out I was in it. He thought he was going to catch the virus like that. The worst part of it is I didn't even know if he was right. So I got educated about it. But while I sat at the table going through all these problems, I said, this can't be what sobriety's got in store for me. I mean, when I go into the rooms, they says, just stay sober and it gets better. It gets better. Not what I'm facing. This can't be what was in store for me. He's got to have something else there. There's supposed to be a message in this. So I had to talk with him. He says, I got a job for you. He says, it's going to require a strong set of legs. So what I'm doing is I'm putting these little hurdles in front of you. And if you can get over them, you're hired. And if you can't, well, if I didn't get over them, it wouldn't matter because we wouldn't be having this conversation. I was ready to end it with one big bang. As an addict, I was isolated. As an addict who was facing what I was facing, I felt they moved me to Jupiter. Nobody was bothering with me. But the true addict I am, when everyone counted me out, that's when I took a stand. That's when I started fighting back. I started like a sponge soaking up information about the virus. I learned everything I could. You, you want to hear how educated I've gotten as far as immunology and HIV goes? A month and a half ago, Columbia University invited me up there to do a workshop in immunology for their first year medical students. Imagine this. Four years ago, I couldn't spell immunology, let alone tell you what it meant or what blood cells were involved. In 1969, I went to Columbia. I says, hey, I want to come here and be a student. They said, what are you kidding? You got a drug problem. You ain't going to make it in here. Now they want me back. The addict I am, I'm finally making it back to college. <laughs> I'm not even going to have to be a student. I'm going to be a teacher first. <laughs> I love the way the program works. <laughs> Unbelievable. Where did they see my bill? <clears throat> right to them. I'm going to give it. I've been invited out to Stony Brook University three times to talk to their graduate students. I went down to Florida State Prison the other day in a military institution. I met with 35 or 40 of their doctors and nurses. When I got through, they took a little video they made of me and they sent it to the state capitol. I got a call two days later that not only did they give me the approval to go in there and carry a message, they were actually going to get funding to do one of the workshops I do and pay me to do a workshop in immunology. Imagine this. I'm going to get paid to talk. Four years ago, they walked into an NA meeting, slipped me five bucks, and told me to shut the fuck up. <laughs> Today, I'm actually getting paid to talk. And the best part of it is, imagine this, I'm on a moving camera over here, did not out once. Four years ago, I couldn't stay awake long enough for a snapshot, let alone moving cameras. And before they put the cameras on, I didn't have to run into the bathroom and do the coke to make me talk the volume so I wouldn't sound neurotic, and then the vodka to wash down the volumes to come down from the coke. <laughs> By the time I made it out of the bedroom, the show was over. I couldn't figure out what I missed. <laughs> oh, man, I thought I had such a great plan. Everything was going according to my time schedule. I've been on TV twice. I got a girl down in Florida in love with me, knows about the virus. 
I met her in Martinique. I got together with 500 recovering people. We chartered a plane, went down to Martinique, and closed down the bar and just took over the island. Would you believe this, 500 recovering people? I did the same thing in May. I went to Mexico with 400 recovering people. Got on the stage and sang. Imagine that, me on the stage with my clothes on. That's another miracle. I go into NA, they says more would be revealed. <laughs> I got on stage and took them literally. In March, I was on stage at the Apollo Theater with four doctors. Would you believe this? They gave out flyers, and next to each doctor's name, they had MD, PhD, RN, CSW. And then they had my name, and they couldn't figure out what to put next to it. <laughs> but to each doctor, they gave instructions on what to talk about. He says, you talk about AIDS, you talk about women and the social issues, you talk about substance abuse. And they got to me and says, Tony, just do your thing. They may have had the degrees, but I didn't need the instructions. Because all the information I'm giving you, I didn't learn in a book. I went down to hell and I got these answers firsthand. I got the scars on my arm to prove it and I got a three-letter scar on my brain called HIV. I feel like he lifted me out of hell to have this virus teach me a message so I can go back to a deeper part to deliver it. Because there are areas in the South Bronx and East Harlem that are so messed up that if I had to go up there for my drugs, I would have detoxed two years ago. Prisons? I was too dumb to make it into a prison. I used to get caught thinking about a crime. Down on Avenue B, cops used to walk up to me and say, what's on your mind? I said, I didn't do anything. He says, yeah, but you were about to. And since they can't arrest you for thinking, I never made it into these places. My prison was up here, impenetrable. The only reprieve I had was one shot a day, and that was it. And all it did was cement the walls even tighter. I did not know how to get out of it. It took HIV to lift me out of this prison and show me that I'm not the piece of shit I thought I was. My biggest fear of getting sober was how am I going to earn a living now? I can't do anything. When you're on drugs and methadone, you can say, well, yeah, I'm a dolphin. I can't work. <laughs> not that you're sober, you've got nothing to fall back on. But it was through dealing with HIV that I found a way of making a living. Because today I come in here and carry the message. Hopefully you'll carry the message to someone else, and that's how it starts. One addict helping another, whether it's HIV, alcohol, or whatever. We might have come in on different boats, but we're all docked in the same harbor waiting for an overhaul. And the only way to fight HIV is to first know whether you've got it. You know that old saying, what you don't know won't hurt you? When it comes to HIV, what you don't know could kill you. There's no way the virus is going to stay in your system and lie dormant the whole time. And let me tell you, it's a lot easier to fight the virus while you're healthy than if you wait till you get sick with pneumonia and say, oh, well, maybe I ought to get tested now. Because if you wait till you get sick to seek treatment, you're not going to be able to handle the virus, let alone the side effects of the medication that's out there. Because anything strong enough to destroy a virus is going to have side effects. Four years ago, I was 20 pounds underweight, losing my sights, and the doctor says, we want you to try this medication, this antiviral therapy. Now, I heard a lot of negative stuff about this. But when you're losing your sight and you're underweight, you really don't care about side effects. It's a matter of life and death. I've been on that antiviral therapy over four years now. My T cells, the little captains of the immune system, were 350 four years ago, they're 330 a month ago. The difference today is I can see who I'm talking to. And that's a direct result of the attitude, being positive, and the medication I take. Today, the pills I take every four hours are helping to save my life, not destroy it. Recovery from any disease is an inside job. Doesn't matter whether you're fighting herpes, diabetes, cancer, stress, depression, or addiction. It comes from in here. If the doctor in here don't want to save you, there ain't a damn thing any other doctor is going to do. The will to survive must be within. I can come over here and put the tools in front of you, or the weapons like I like to use. I can't make you pick them up. It's up to you. If I put the weapon in your hand and showed you how to fire it, it's like me going up to a doctor and saying, hey, doctor, cure me of my virus. If he says, yeah, I'd give him the virus and go out and get another one. I have to be responsible for the mess I got myself into. 
My old attitude picked up this virus. My new attitude is helping to deal with it. I saw treatment. I'm responsible today. I take my medication when I'm supposed to. Today, I don't go into doctors and say, what do you think I should be on? I go to doctors and I say, this is where my blood work is at, and this is how low my T-cells have got. The virus seems to be dormant right now because my numbers are stable, and I think my white and red count might be able to handle some medication. What do you think I should do? I'm empowered today. I have information. I'm not some dope fiend walking in off the street and the doctor says, hey, there's another drug addict. Why bother saving him? Let me just put it off for a while, you know, maybe in another month or two. He won't even be around, so I won't have to worry about a prescription. No, but today I go out there and educate doctors. And doctors look at me, a high school graduate, and say, wait a second. If this guy can get this information where he's teaching medical people, there must be something else. Maybe drug addicts aren't that lost bunch we thought they were. And if he can do it, maybe others can do it. It's about empowerment, man. I'm telling you that if a high school graduate can do it as negative as I was, anybody can do it. You don't have to college graduate to understand the immune system. All the immune system is is a big police station. And you can all identify with that. <laughs> all it takes is you being open receptive to the message. And you're here today, and that's the first step. Because anybody sitting in this room has got a lot to be grateful for, whether you realize it or not. Because three weeks ago, I was standing outside of a shooting gallery built out of cardboard and mattresses. The candle was so low in there that when the guy hit the bag up against the dope to see if there was anything in it, he couldn't see if there was drugs in the bag, let alone if there was blood in the syringe he just borrowed from a guy who was either on a crack run or dying of AIDS. But when it comes to drug addicts, you have to treat their primary disease, which is addiction. If you don't take care of addiction, you can't educate them about HIV. If a guy is shaking because he needs a shot of dope or he's neurotic because he got off the stem, you can't stand there and carry a message. One disease at a time. See, if I thought I was going to die of AIDS, I'd go out and get high. If I went out and got high, I probably would die of AIDS. I keep both diseases at the top of the ladder. Each one gets my undivided attention. You want to have, hear how simple I keep this program? I'm up six every morning. I do my push-ups, eat my Wheaties, and I get my ass to an AA meeting. I didn't go to AA to get sober. I went there to look at women. While I was looking at women, I heard the message. The message says, stay sober, and you can come back and look at more women. <laughs> at least that's the way. I figured that out. I was under 90 days. What do you want? <laughs> the bottom line is I showed up. I got my ass to those meetings, and whatever pair of legs or skirt I was looking at, I heard those steps. And I started to look at the first step. Yeah, I was powerless over that crap. I'm also powerless to a degree over HIV, but not the same way I am over the drugs and the alcohol. Today, I've got a lot of power over HIV. So when I found out about HIV, I found out it's got a, an arsenal of weapons. They're called stress, anxiety, depression, drugs, and alcohol. That's what the virus has got on its side. So I says, okay, if the virus has got its weapons, I said, I must have something. So I looked on my side, and I seen the change in attitude, the positive thinking, the laughter to strengthen the immune system. Because if you ever notice, a person who's depressed gets a cold, and they can't get rid of it. A person who laughs a lot and has his attitude in check gets a cold, and he can't figure out if it's an allergy or a cold because it's not there long enough to analyze. Laughter has a direct response on the way your blood cells fight to save your life. There are little receptors on cells called the macrophages and T-cells that are in direct contact with these neuropeptides that the brain sends it. If the brain sends a neuropeptide that says, I'm a piece of shit and I don't deserve to live, these guys take bed rest and they don't bother fighting. If the message coming down says, I'm worth something today, so let's go for it. And those little suckers go on patrol. I got like little rambles in here. They go on these little scouting expeditions. <laughs> you want to hear something? The other day I was sitting on the train and it gets stalled down uh, Times Square. <clears throat> so I'm thinking, what am I going to do? Now I'm getting bored. The train is loaded. So I says, how about sending them out little war games? I says, you know, a little practice game. So immediately I felt something moving in here. And I was thinking, wow, the virus was listening. So it's like a bugle went off in my head, a battle cry was sounded, my troops were loaded, geared up and ready for action. 
Within seconds, that problem was relieved. The problem I thought was the virus. Turned out to be gas. <laughs> That's not important. They're like the Mounties. They always get their man. Unfortunately, it's not always the right man. But today, they respond to it. And I'm just trying to tell you that if you don't have the virus, you don't have to catch it. And if you've got it, it can be dealt with. And the proof is right up here. Like I says, I didn't read this stuff in the book, man. I had to learn my answers the hard way. And I go into a place like this and I see people who are down in hell already. I can help lead the way back. And for those people who are on their way down, I can show them what roads to avoid. Like I says, if you want to carry a message, you've got to get the right messenger. It seems like my whole life has been oriented to tell people about HIV. I can't believe this. I thought when I got sober, I'd be on Park Avenue, the Mercedes would be down on Mulberry Street, Brooke Shields would be calling me every 10 minutes. I didn't get any of that. I still got a 10-speed with a flat. I've got five bucks in my pocket, and I got a girl 1,200 miles away in Florida. <laughs> well, here's something. I met her on this sober trip in Martinique. So after two days, I make it up to my room with her. <clears throat> We're laying in bed, and we both got our clothes on. So she's wondering, what's wrong with me? Why ain't they doing anything? So I says, there's this little something I forgot to mention. <laughs> I thought it might be a good time to come out with it. <laughs> she turns around and says, all right, you're either gay or you're positive. I said, well, I'm not gay. At least I don't do that anymore. <laughs> she says, all right, then you're positive. I says, yeah. The first thing was I thought she was going to make an exit for the door and run out. Because that's happened before. I got in bed with one girl, and we both winded up nude before I came out with this. I mean, I didn't even see it coming. It happened so quick. I never seen her again. Then I got in bed with one girl who says, okay, I know what HIV is about. You got to put a condom on. Now I'm lost. I was expecting to be rejected. I was going to tell her, hey, you don't know what you're missing. Now she says, let me see what I'm missing. I mean, sexually, uh, I'm a little out of practice. You know, after 15 volumes and a pint of vodka, you're too comatose to remember what sex was. Now I got a girl ready to do something with me and I'm lost. You know, I didn't have to get it up when I was out there, not unless I was going to earn a buck or trade it for a few bags of coke. That's how I used sex. Because I was a lousy dope fiend. I couldn't steal and I couldn't gamble. Fortunately, I kept myself in shape, so I presented somewhat of a decent looking book. People didn't know that behind the cover, the story was sort of messed up. But that was okay, because I only did it for the money. The number of relationships I had, I can count on one hand. In fact, that one hand was my biggest relationship. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it takes what it takes. <clears throat> I mean, if he didn't develop arthritis, I would have never went out there looking for a woman. <laughs> but you know what? Life has been great, man. Because there are a lot of benefits behind testing positive. You want to hear something? The Transit Authority in New York considers me handicapped. They let me on the trains for half fare. Imagine this, I don't have to jump the turnstiles anymore. In 1982, I borrowed $8,000 to go to school and pick up a trade, which I nodded out in the whole time. A year ago, the government sent me a letter stating, hey, you think it's about time you started paying this money back? I sent them a letter stating there's this little problem I picked up when I was shooting drugs. I probably won't live long enough to pay you. They erased the student loan. I went to California, 10 o'clock at night. I parked in the parking space that had a wheelchair underneath. Now, 10 o'clock at night, how are you supposed to see what's parked underneath your car? Got back to New York, made a copy of my half fare card, sent it back to them. I says, hey, you see, I'm handicapped too. They ripped up the $150 ticket. <laughs> I knew this virus would come in handy. <laughs> I go to the gay men's health crisis, I have free lunches, use their gym, they teach you how to play guitar, so you get free haircuts, the doctors with the chiropractors are all free, the girls with the massages for nothing. And you know why they let me up there? Because I've got the virus. You don't have the virus, you can't get up there. You have to be in the arc or the age stages. There are unbelievable resources out there. See, the problem is some of you are going to leave here and wait until you're on the outside to get tested. The problem with that is if you leave here and you don't have medical insurance, a doctor's not going to want to bother with you. 
He's not going to want to deal with a dope fiend who come up positive and who can't even pay his bill, let alone for medication. Medication is expensive, so are doctor's bills. But when you leave here with a diagnosis, your chances of getting treated on the outside are a lot better. Because now you're leaving here and they know you're HIV positive and you're on medication. So all you need is a script. You don't have to have this doctor, you know, go through all this new stuff because you're a patient who didn't know his status. A lot of people are probably in here and don't have a trade. I didn't have a trade when I got sober. Through HIV, I found one. Because the same way I carry the message, you can carry the message. The virus has not only given me my life back, it's given me a way to earn money, which I never had before. I do more traveling now, at least today when I fly, my feet actually leave the ground. That's another switch. The only flying I did was back and forth to Alphabet City, where I got my master's degree in substance abuse. And that's only because I failed every course out there that I was able to get that degree. <clears throat> I just want to finish up by saying I wouldn't trade my worst day with this virus for my best day out there. Because for the first time in my life, I'm no longer part of the problem. Today, I'm a good part of the solution. And even if I die tomorrow, it would be okay. Because I'm in there fighting today. And long as I'm in the ring, when the bell ends that 15th round and my hands are up, I'm a winner no matter who gets the decision. Well, I got about another hour? <clears throat> no, huh? All right, give it a shot. Well, I love a captive audience. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Matt, if you've got any questions now, <clears throat> anything at all, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> medication that you use, right? What kind of medication do you use? Well, I'm an antiviral therapy. It's called AZT. Uh, the question is, right, they have uh, all kinds of medications, right? They have AZTs, DDCs. Uh, which one is best? Well, there's only one that's approved. I'm on AZT over four years, my blood work is still the same, like I said, today I can see. So I'm not going to mess with it. It's if the wheel works, don't try to invent a new one. This is what goes for me. I'm not telling you what to try, all I'm saying is get tested. This way you'll have the option of trying something. Your doctor will prescribe the rest. I'm also on pentamidine. Pentamidine is like a big crack pipe that you breathe in once a month and it protects your lungs from the pneumonia. They have stuff called Bactrim that protects your whole body from the pneumonia. So I'm giving you information. So if some of you come up and test positive and your doctor doesn't prescribe it, you could say, hey, wait a second. <clears throat> My T cells have hit this level. How come you don't have me on Bactrim or Pentamine? Or how come you haven't prescribed AZT yet? Ask questions. Don't go in there to fool and let him, you know, dictate the tone. Go in there with empowerment and just say, help me. This is my situation. Yeah. What side effects from uh, AZT? I don't know. I haven't been through any of them. The AZT lowers your red count. You know what a red blood cell does? Blood cells carry oxygen to the parts of the body, and the brain is one of them. But you can understand what one of the symptoms might be. And the other one is your white count. Sometimes the very immune system you build up may be sort of suppressed by medications like AZT. If you're too weak to take it, but as it's holding down your immune system, it stops the virus from replicating. Yeah. I've been down 19 months, right? And at the beginning of this month, I took the HIV test. Two weeks later, it came back negative. How accurate is this test? The test is 99% accurate. If you shot dope today or had unprotected sex, if I were you, I would wait at least six months to get tested. If after the six months, you came up negative again, then I might take it another six months down the line. But if you're still negative after a year, I would leave it alone. Because sometimes anticipation of coming down positive causes more problems than the virus itself. Right, in the back, let me get the one in the back. Can you ask me this question in society, right? How is, is this disease spreading more in the heterosexual community or in the, in the in drug abusers community? The heterosexual community is on the upswing because a lot of the women are out there right now and don't know who they're having sex with. They have sex with a guy who looks healthy because he doesn't show any signs. He's asymptomatic. 
I worked on Wall Street for four years. I know what guys do on their lunch hour, the drugs they do. I know the women they have sex with after work. And what do they do after work and after they have sex with this woman, the prostitutes? They go home and they might have sex again with their wife, who's eventually going to have a baby, who's going to come down with HIV, and has no idea what the three letters mean. Denial, a big, a big thing in that. Yeah. All right, my question to you actually is like 10 questions in one, you know. Um, I attend these meetings because by all means I want to learn how to protect myself against this virus and I, I need every information I could get out of them. My question to you is this, I know how to protect myself against a prostitute and I sure know how to protect myself with a needle. If somebody uses a needle, I'm not going to use it. How will I protect myself against a dentist or a physician that is licensed by the state of New York and the state does not put in effect a bill demanding that this physician let me know what he's got before he put his hands on me. Yeah, that's tricky because I still don't understand how the dentist could give it to someone unless his tools were infected and he used them right after that. See, the virus doesn't survive well outside the blood system, but it's not known exactly how long it will live. That's why people who share needles the needle can li the virus can live a lot longer in a needle because what does a dope fiend do when he pulls the needle out of his arm? Puts it in a glass of water and lets it stay there. Water is a moist environment, a perfect habitat for the virus. Now if I was over here and I bled on the ground, the air passing over it would eventually deactivate the virus. But if I put a needle with my blood in a glass of water over here, the virus would live a lot longer. Now with the doctors, I don't know how to handle that. You know, I got to handle my own virus right now. I don't know what issues to take. Because if you tested all the doctors out there, you could have other problems. You know, people who can still perform might be ostracized, might be, you know, avoided. So, you know, one thing I would do is if I was in jail, I wouldn't be sharing razor blades that easy. Because that's another thing. People bleed on their face. Blood carries over. The next guy picks it up, uses the blade. He might cut himself. And then the blood goes from there to there. Yeah. My question to you is, right, I want like your opinion on this, or what, you're not, or what the knowledge you have on it. This disease, they said it was brought over on a monkey from Africa, some said it was man-made in a lab. I mean, you know, I want some insight on that. Well, <clears throat> I don't know if it was man-made, they said it was in the green monkeys, and then when the uh, cattle died from the drought, people had to eat the green monkeys and it went from them to the people. Well, let me propose this to you. If you went back to your cell right now and there was a tiger laying in the middle, would you stop and ask him if he came through the front window or through the gate? But you, you see my point? The tiger's there. The first thing you do is you get your ass out of there. The virus is here. I have to deal with it. If I put too much energy into trying to figure out where the virus came from, I'll take the focus off what I should be doing is dealing with the virus, not in trying to deal with the people who brought it in, however it came in. Yeah that the United States government is stopping the immigrants from coming into the United States because they have the virus. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I heard something about Haiti, that they're trying to watch the people coming in because Haiti has a big problem with HIV. The government has a problem with dealing with HIV right now because of the spread and because of the lack of maybe the politicians really wanting to help. The last thing they need is more people coming in with it. I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I'm just trying to explain what I think is going on with the government. Oh, wait, we're over here. Sorry. He says that a few years ago, the incubation period of the virus was five years. He says not too long ago, they extended it to 10 years. You all know what the incubation period is? You're talking about from the time you stick a spike in your arm till the time you test positive, or from the time you test positive till the time you get sick? All right. All right. There are some people who have the virus and stay healthy as long as 10 years before they show any signs. In New York City, there are 250,000 IV drug users. At least 60% of them are positive. 90% of the people with the virus don't even know it because they're asymptomatic. They have no signs yet. The way you handle the virus depends on this how your immune system is when you get the virus. 
Drug users don't usually handle the virus as well as homosexuals. Obvious. The drug user gets the virus because he shot drugs. Drugs alone tear down your immune system. Homosexuals get it from sex. Sex doesn't necessarily tear your immune system down. Some homosexuals get diagnosed with AIDS because of the cancer, Kaposi sarcoma. Their immune system can be up here when they get diagnosed with cancer, with AIDS. If a dog fiend gets diagnosed with AIDS, it's usually because he got PCP, the pneumonia, which comes in when your T cells are like 200. So here's a homosexual diagnosed with AIDS up here, and here's a dog fiend diagnosed with AIDS. His immune system is down here. Who do you think is going to live longer? The homosexual, because he's got a better immune system to begin with. That's why people who get it from drugs need to take action right away. Because who knows how long they got it. And it's a lot cheaper for a prison to monitor someone who's got HIV as opposed to supporting them if he got AIDS and he needs life support machines and everything else. Prisons give out free AZT. They keep you on pendamine bactrim, whatever they prescribe. It's not that you come down positive and then there are no treatments. I know, I get my medication free. I live in New York State because I make under 44,000. ADAP gives me free AZT and pendamidine. ADAP is the state AIDS drug assistant program. They tell me what pharmacy I can use for and they give me an ID card. I go there and I'm the first one served. No money involved. If you seek treatment now, yes. But if you find out you got the virus and you're not doing anything about it, hey, you got it. Right there. Right now, I got I basically got four major questions for you. Um, when I be given, I used to give the AIDS seminar, and this question came up a lot: when having sex, oral sex, with a female or male female. Uh, a lot of people say, well, I'm safe. I use Saram wrap, you know, Reynolds wrap. Yeah. What is the risk with that? With Saran wrap? Well, I if you can't afford a dental dam, I would say Saran wrap is the next best thing. You may not taste as much, but <laughs> basically you can feel it. Uh, you really want to catch the virus, open the back door. People say, why is it easier to catch the virus back here? <laughs> but forget, the asshole was made for things to come out of, not for things to go into. In that process, things tear very easy. Very delicate skin back there. Once it's torn, that's an open gate for the virus. Uh, oral sex, I don't know anybody personally who's caught the virus from oral sex. I hear there are one or two. Because there is something in the digestive system that deactivates the virus. But if somebody is fighting herpes and they've got open sores in their mouth, anything's possible. I'm not saying go out and, you know, perform it to try my theory. <laughs> yeah, wait, let's get one back. Oh, you had something else? Um, when you was describing, you know, how to get... AIDS, you know, once AIDS come into your body and everything, you're using big words and it's like, I'm a college grad and I couldn't understand what you were saying. You know, the way you contact it, once, you, once AIDS come into your body, what does it do to your body? How come you break down so fast? He wants to know, when the virus comes into your immune system, why does it attack it and why do you get sick, right? All right. The virus by itself cannot do anything, can't cause any damage. It needs a blood cell. What does the blood cell have that the virus uses? A factory. You heard of RNA and DNA, things like that? All it is is a blueprint of genetic information. The virus is called a retrovirus. It's got RNA, it's got one blueprint. Your blood cell's got another blueprint called DNA. Before the virus can get into your blood cell and take over, the blueprint has to be similar. You all heard of Woolworths and Gimbel's, those department stores? Picture, Woolworths is a small department store, Gimbel's is a lot bigger. Picture the owner of Woolworths walks into Gimbel's, takes over Gimbel's factories to make the stuff that Woolworths needs. Let me run that by you again. The owner of Woolworths goes into Gimbel's, he tells Gimbel's factories, make this stuff because Woolworths needs it. The virus goes into your blood cell, takes over your blood cell, and has the blood cell make more viruses. 
Remember I told you about the RNA having to look like DNA? That's where AZT comes in, and DVI and DVC. They stop the rewriting of RNA into DNA. It's like, uh, if I told you all you got to do is drink orange juice and you get all the vitamin C and stay healthy. The first thing you do is you go to the grocery store and buy up all the orange juice you can get. That makes sense. Before you went to the grocery store, I went in there. I switched the orange juice with orange water. Now what you do is you're buying orange water and you're going out and drinking and trying to stay healthy and you can't. Because it's not what you thought it is. The virus needs an enzyme called reverse transcript. All it means is reverse the writing. That's what transcript means. AZT disguises itself as that reverse transcriptase. Now the virus, thinking it's getting the enzyme, is taking in AZT. And it starts trying to rewrite its RNA into DNA, and it can't. The chain is stopped right there. That'll just give you an idea with some of the medications. That's what they call antiviral therapy. It's against the virus. Yeah, the green shirt. And to know what are some of the symptoms of a person who has AIDS or the virus, or however it is. That's tricky because some of the symptoms that a person is going to have who's got the virus are the same symptoms that you're going to have if you just came off a coke run or a crack run. Night sweats, you wake up in the middle of the night and you're soaking wet and it's not because the heat was on. Dry cough, you're not smoking crack, you lost 10% of your body weight and you're not on coke. You've got lip notes under here, under here or down here that are swollen. Diarrhea. I'm talking about if you're going through two or three or more of these symptoms and you've got them for over a month, get tested. Now, if you just came off a heavy coke run and you come in and you're 20 pounds underweight, I'm not suggesting you stop buying a cemetery plot because you think you got AIDS. What I'm saying is if you're fighting two or three or more of these and you've got nothing to attribute it to, take a look at the high-risk behavior you lived. Yeah. If they found a cure, right, for the, for, the, for the HIV or AIDS, whatever, all right, would the immune system regroup? I mean, would your body come back to normal again? Will the T cells and the, and the red blood cells? Uh... It depends on how far down your immune system is to begin with. He wants to know if, if your immune system, if they find the cure for AIDS, and you've got AIDS and you take the cure, could you eventually get the soldiers back? I've never heard of that many people with 50 T cells or below going back up. Two, three hundred, you got a chance. But once your immune system goes so low, there's only so much you can do for it. Um, if a person has got the virus, right, and living in a close environment such as a prison, who is more at risk of getting sick, a, a person with the virus or somebody that's not with the virus? Because they think, people think that that they got to worry about somebody with, with the virus, that they're going to get sick. So who is more at risk? If I give someone a hug and he's negative, I stand more of a chance of catching something than he does. Because if I got the virus and I hug you and you don't have it, I stand the chance of getting sick a lot quicker than you because you've got germs your body can handle, but that mind can't. Uh, my question is this, man. I would like to know, I'm if two married couples, right? They both um, test the po a negative, right? right? Now they don't got a relationship with other partners. What's the chance of, the, of they of they getting infected? Well, as long as you're doing it with someone who doesn't have the virus and you don't have it, you don't have to worry about it. But then there's the other question. I had a guy come up and he says, "I've got the virus. My wife has also got the virus, so I don't need protection." Is that true? Why does he need protection? He's like adding more, you know, reinfecting the, the virus, right? It's like she may have two Indians, but every time he pumps it into her, he adds two and two and two. And eventually goes from two Indians to a tribe to a war party. Yeah. What's the function of the four T cells? And what happens when you run out of them? He wants to know the function of a T4 cell. Whether you're fighting HIV, like I said, herpes or cancer, the same battle is going to be going on in here. You want to know what the T4 cell is? Just picture a police station. You have little cells in there called macrophages. You know what a patrol car does for a police station? What it does is it goes out and when it sees a crime, it picks up the criminal. What does the patrol car do after that? Sends a call back to the captain, which is the T4 cell. 
What does the captain do when he finds out there's a problem? Sends out an APB. Who gets it? The sergeant. Who are the sergeants? The B cells. They turn in, their, they put their uniforms on into plasma cells, make their weapons, which are the antibodies, and your attack is launched. The same police station in here can be related to the police station out there. It's basically the same thing. Very simple to understand. Your T4 cell is the captain. Everybody knows that an army is in an army without a captain. That's why it's so important. Finish. When you run out of them, other problems come in. The lower the soldiers go, the higher the Indians go. How, how can you bring them back up? Well, like I said, when they get so low, like 50 and below, it's hard to bring them back up. Because sometimes you reach a point where you can stay healthy. I got friends with nine T-cells. They're not even in the A's classification yet. I got five. Yeah, well, that's what I'm telling you. You know what you do. When the doctor told me I got the virus, he says, before you got this virus, you had like a thousand T-cells. So what I seen in my mind was a thousand soldiers with rifles. Now I want to take the test, he says, you got 500. So in my mind, what I seen is 500. But what I did was I took away the rifles, I gave them machine guns. Next time I took the test, he says, you're down to 200. All right. Well, I did mentally was, I took away the machine guns and I gave them bazookas. <laughs> and if it goes down to four, I take away the bazookas and I give them a couple of MXs and say, blow up the works. The lower my blood work goes, the higher my attitude goes. There's one thing I know of that can beat positive blood work, and I'm sure it is. And that's a positive attitude. And just for today, I've proven that theory. Because I'm sober and I'm healthy. I don't have to stay sober and healthy the rest of my life. I've only got to do it for today. That takes a big burden off my back, man. Because if I don't drink today, I can stay healthy. If I stay healthy today, I really won't have to drink or drug. The green shirt. What's the discrimination rate out there? Is it still the same as it was when it first came out? Or is it a little better now? I mean, do you feel that you get discriminated on a lot? Because of what? Being an addict or HIV? HIV positive. In New York, not that bad. I go into my AA meetings and I talk about it and these people still hug me after I leave. But I'm living down in Florida with my girl. I can't even talk about HIV down there. Because I'm afraid she's going to lose her business because of me. The virus got me sober, and for me to go into an AA meeting that I'm comfortable with and not be able to talk about it, that's fucked up. The biggest weapon I had with the virus is going in there and telling people how I'm dealing with it. You know, and having them come up and say, yeah, I understand what you're doing. If there's any way I can help you, fine. But here I go into an AA meeting down there, and I can say, yeah, when I got sober, I was on life support and I lost my sight. What I can't say is what caused it. Big denial down there. And the people in denial are usually the first ones to get the virus because they don't take precautions. The yellow shirt. Um, what are the major body fluids that you can catch it from? I know some people think that, well, if this guy spit on me and he has AIDS, I can catch it. Well, that's like saying, if you're deep kissing with a person who's got the virus, can you catch it like that? The virus is in the saliva, but it's in such low quantities that you probably have to swallow about five buckets of spit to catch it. And if you don't catch the virus, I'm thinking of a couple other things you're going to pick up. It's in highest quantities in the blood and then the semen. You want to hear something? I went on Park Avenue where the, the working girls are, and I'm handing out literature trying to tell them about the virus. So I go up to one working girl and I says, listen, you know how you come in contact with this virus? I says, it's by coming in contact with semen. She says, well, then I'm safe, man, because I don't fuck with them sailors. <laughs> now you know why these people need the education out there. I couldn't help but laugh. <laughs> right there, I think. You stated that 60% in New York City, all right, has the virus, right? No, not 60% in New York City. 60% of the IV drug addicts in New York City. Of the IV drug users. How can you really tell who's who and who got what? You can't. You can't look at someone and tell them they've got the virus. 
because when they're asymptomatic, meaning when they don't have signs, they look healthy. They just look just like me and you. I mean, do I look like I've got the virus? I didn't think you did. That's what I mean. But you see, I've had problems with the virus, but I bounce back. And it's in this period that you don't know what the person has got. Yeah. There's some statistics out stating that 63% of males that come to Rikers Island are HIV positive, 33% female. Most of us upstate come from New York City. I want to know if there's any projected statistics stating like a year from now, two years, what, what is going to be the AIDS epidemic proportion because a lot of us are going to be coming out in the street then. What you're giving us today is preventive information. But also, that might help us scare a little bit too to see how serious this is about. I, I, my brain isn't in recovery long enough to remember all the numbers that are out there. But a lot of you people are going to make it out of prison and a lot of the ones who make it out are going to wind up back in. And in between that time, you're going to pick up another problem called HIV. All I'm here to tell you is that if you don't have it, you don't have to catch it. And if you've got it, it can be dealt with. So when you're out there, take precautions. Know the status of your person. All right, I think we've sort of wound it up, and thanks for your attention, man. Man. Last time that many people stood in one room and looked at me, I didn't stick around to see what they wanted. <laughs> I was out of there. <laughs> ah. Man, is it warm in this shirt? <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I'm glad I don't have to say I can identify with you. That's all right, man. And I'm glad that they align you with places where you couldn't enter. <laughs> hey. Takes what it takes. You know what I mean? Man's got to do what he's got to do. You got it, man. Subscribe, hey, brother. Be Thanks a, subscribe a lot. Subscribe, TV or something? No, they're going to mass produce it and send it into the other prison systems. Thanks, Listen, man. Man. You, know, you got I, it. I never got sick in my life, right? Eh? Yeah. I never got, I probably get a cold. It's only one, two days. But I've seen people get cold, and you know, they be there.